I work with John to kind of help pull some of this material together, so um, hopefully I won't mess it up too badly. Um, just before we move on, I just want to kind of now that I've got sole control of the microphone, just add a couple of things I just want to point out from the previous session. Um, the first relates to kind of MTA agreements that you have where you work with a, with a larger partner, be it a pharma diagnostics device company, um, on, your, on your product, uh, which is in that contract, make sure that you have ownership of the data. There's a lot of people who don't, are so excited about getting this you know, kind of collaboration set up with someone who's going to add a lot of validation to their, um, their, their technology, and then they're not allowed to use that data, market the data, or even know what the data ended up being. And it's just a, something that I've seen people miss and regret it. So think of that. And then the other one is, when you do your licensing agreement, if you are a platform company, you've got multiple things you want to do, invariably, there is a lead program that is the most advanced. And you do have to balance um, doing a license deal on that program with a GSK or a Johnson & Johnson, um, being careful that first of all, all of your resources end up kind of getting sucked up towards servicing that program such that you never end up developing any of the pipeline assets. And then secondly, externally, you kind of end up looking like a bit of subsidiary for Johnson & Johnson, and therefore, when it comes to exiting your business, no one else wants to go near any auction process because they kind of assume that one way or another it's a Johnson & Johnson company already. So those are just some of the things to be careful with, to think about when you're kind of getting really excited about your licensing deal. Okay, all right. Um, starting up, so this was supposed to be a kind of mixed bag of, of <coughs> things to be thinking about as you, how do you actually do this? Um, and it will have some overlap with things that Gene said about business plans um, and um, negotiate, well, Newman said about kind of interacting with investors, um, but it's just then to be kind of in terms of how, how do you actually, in the first three months, what are you supposed to be thinking about actually doing? Um, so, this is a kind of hypothetical uh, flow chart of, of how this might work. You come up with a great idea, um, you know, you're, the, you're the scientist, you need, you've, you need a team, so you go out into the you know, world and find a team. Some of that team may be the guy sitting next to you on, on the lab bench. You might go out using competition you know, programs like this to um, find other members. You might need some commercial help from an MBA, so you formed your team. Then you build your plan. This is where we're gonna to get to. We're gonna do this, this, and this. Now we've got our plan, we've got our team around our technology. We go out into the marketplace and we find investment, uh, angel investors, venture capitals, whatever. We've now got the money and now we execute on that plan and everybody is happy and makes a lot of money when we exit for billions of dollars. So that's, that's kind of in theory how it should work. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. This is a this is a kind of a constantly iterating process. So you come up with your idea, you you find some team members, they disagree with how you're gonna uh, what you're gonna do with that idea. You iterate on the idea, you get agreement on that. You build a plan. How are we gonna execute on this um, technology? Then you realize there are gaps in your team, uh, in your team, meaning that you couldn't deliver on your plan. So you need to go and increase, uh, your, uh, uh, find, find someone else to join into your team. You bring them in, they don't agree with your plan, you go back to the original idea, and then you refine your plan. Great, okay, so we've done an iterative process. Then you need investment, and you come to someone like me, and you turn up with, this is our technology, this is our plan, and I say, that's a fantastic technology, your plan is rubbish. And now you've got kind of multiple iterations, um, going round and round in circles, and eventually you come to some type of agreement, I give you some money, we execute on the plan, and then two months down the road, something changes, and we have to completely change the plan. So just to give you a kind of expectation that the idea that you turned up today with, the, the, the kind of 750 business plans I had to read through um, on the kind of 20th of December or something, you know, the majority of those um, that a lot of you who turn up today, who made it through that process, by the end of tomorrow even, or, or maybe 
you know, by the end of this program, will have maybe the underlying technology is the same, but actually the plan might look very, very different. And I would say, in my experience, more than 50% of the teams that I meet at this, this event, by the time you get to the end, are totally different. It, used to, it started out as a vaccine adjuvant. It ended up as an immune oncology company. Um, although, actually, that said, most things end up as an immune oncology company. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So how are you, you going to go about thinking this? And as I said, there'll, there'll be overlap with, between some of these sessions, and that's the point. So if you hear it lots of times, you, you might think it a bit. So can you satisfy an, an unmet need? You've got a technology. It's a kind of extremely elegant piece of science. But is it ever going to be any use to someone? What problems are you going to solve with it? And is it actually a problem that's worth solving? Um, Time and again, I, I see companies, and then we've heard a little bit about this in the last section about platform companies. Someone may have a, a, a kind of very elegant way to produce antibodies uh, that can hit targets that no one else has here to managed to, to drug. And they turn up and they say, so why don't you, they ask me to give them all of the targets that I would like to be drugged, and then they'll go away and do them. Uh, the problem is, I don't know which targets are worth drugging, and if, to be honest, if I did, I probably wouldn't just be freely telling them what are the most interesting biological targets. So you have to be a uh, solving a problem and working out what is the best way to solve that problem, as opposed to a technology that is very elegant, but just wandering around looking for a problem to solve. Um, who will buy your idea? Who is ultimately going to pay it? If it's digital health, that's a very complex um, Question, if it's a drug, it's going to be reimbursement agencies um, is, is potentially one group of people. So whether it's NICE in the UK or it's an insurance company in the US, who's going to make that decision? The other people who are going to quote unquote buy your idea are maybe a pharma company who wants to buy your company. So you need to be always moving towards a product that someone is going to want to buy, knowing who that person is and uh, basically delivering a product offering that they will um, pay you lots of money. Being honest with yourself, I, can you actually do it better than anybody else? Because if you can't, if you can do it, but so can other people, you're going to find it very different, difficult to, to differentiate yourself and climb above the noise of lots of other technologies trying to, trying to attack the same problem. Um, uh, and you know, to some extent in drugs, you have intellectual property to help um, differentiate yourself because no one else is allowed to kind of move in on your protected space. But nonetheless, you are competing with not just people who have uh, um, you know, antibodies against the target, you've got small molecules, all the way through to um, devices that are going after the same disease through to lifestyle choices. So is your technology the best way to solve this problem? Um, and be honest with yourself because you can save, your, save everybody a lot of time and money and find a different idea to do. Um, so be honest with yourself up front. Um, is it, can, you've got the technology, you've got the plan, can you make it work? Um, a lot, um, so is what you're trying to achieve with your technology just technically feasible? Um, is it going to, is it within the realms of the, the financing you're ever going to be able to access is it deliverable on that amount of money? And the same applies on time scale. Is it going to take, are we going to spend the first eight years iterating on your extremely complex combined cell therapy iterated with a mobile app or something that you'll never end up really delivering it into uh, to market? Um, and what does the route map look, look like? Can you, can you find quick and elegant ways to get proof of concept, to de-risk de um, the hypothesis of what you're trying to do for its own sake, but also to be able to get um, an audience with pharma partners or investors to give them uh, confidence that actually your program is worth backing and that you can do it in an efficient, cost-effective way. Um, okay, what can go wrong? Every single thing can go wrong. Um, and as I mentioned actually in my previous talk, it's most often the really boring and the seemingly irrelevant things that really trip you up. 
Um, the best outcome, well, it's not the best outcome, but it's a perfectly good outcome, uh, is ultimately if you have done all the hard work, got into a clinical trial setting, executed, recruited 200 patients in a double-blinded placebo trial, and the drug does absolutely no better than the placebo, and you know that the drug has got there, you've got the right dose, PK, PD is all matching up, and it does absolutely nothing, that is almost a perfect result. Because what it tells you is you have tested a biological hypothesis, and the biological hypothesis was wrong. That is a good, that is a good outcome. What is a bad outcome is um, you went too fast from uh, hit to lead to candidate and put a molecule in that had some PK issues or some off-target effects, and you nonetheless, you got all the way through, you run your trial and actually realized that the drug never got to where it needed to be, and therefore you never even tested the biological hypothesis, and yet you've wasted all that money and all that time, and you have to go back to the drawing board. So it's every single thing can go wrong, and how do you mitigate it? And you, and you have to plan in advance thinking about where are the buckets of risk in this program. So is it, is it, is it uh, molecule risk? Is it manufacturing risk? Is it formulation? Is there regulatory risk? Is this something that the regulator, are you moving, you're so ahead of the curve that the regulator has never had to even consider a technology like this before. So you don't have a clue whether they'll let you do a straight into man trial or they'll make you do two, two years of carcin uh, carcinogenic um, tox testing. Build out those buckets of risk and make a plan for how you will adapt to them as and when they arise. Do you have a good team? You heard earlier that actually, in the end, investors invest in teams, not just the technologies. Um, there's a quote. John came up with it. I don't know where he heard it from, so I don't know who to attribute it to, but I'll read it. Um, always invest in an A-class team with a B-class idea rather than a B-class team with an A-class idea. Um, I don't know where it came from, but I agree with it. Um, because ultimately, because of the complexity of this, because of all the things that can go wrong, it's the team that will be able to iterate, pivot quickly, uh, go out there, knock down doors, solve problems, get over hurdles that they face all along the way, that a team that is a bit deer in headlights or not quite as high energy will just die on the die on the vine. Um, so it really is all about putting together the right team. So at that point, you're at the point where you're building your team. So the few things that you need to um, you know, work out. So first of all is, you know, you're at the kind of pre-company formation stage. Most of you, um, you know, you're all here excited about entrepreneurship, but you may all have quite different long-term aspirations about what your role within this company is or you know um, ge generally entrepreneurship some of you kind of are the founding scientists and will uh, love to see this company kind of set up and put on its way but then you actually want to go back and have a career continuing to be in research producing new technologies and that's fantastic um, some of you you know, are kind of real entrepreneur CEO material and you want to take this business and run with it um, all, all aspirations are viable. The key thing is to work out who's going to do what and be open and transparent with each other so that down the line there wasn't a miscommunication and you end up with the team falling apart and everybody getting upset with each other. So you need to have, right at the start, a very open and frank discussion um, about what, your, what each of your um, aspirations are. Um, and part of that is who is the leader. Um, I actually always rec recommend to teams that are at your stage often to not nominate someone as CEO. Um, you can have, you should identify who is the kind of like the leader, call them COO, Chief Operating Officer or Chief Executive Officer. The reason is because in nine times out of ten, by the time this company uh, gets eight years down the line from now, the management team, just because of what is, in, what is involved, the, the, the skills that are required at different stages along the way, will evolve. They naturally will. That doesn't mean you can't be involved in the, um, continue to be very much, the founders can't uh, continue to be involved in the company, but their role in the company will, will shift. 
Um, and it's always, it, um, there's no reason it should be, but it always is hard to demote someone from being CEO to being bringing in another CEO. So I actually often advise startup companies to not bother calling someone a CEO, even though someone will be, have to lead the process. Um, so you need to work out within your, what don't you have within the, in the team. Identify the gaps, whether it's, you know, you've got a load of biology but no chemistry, you've got a load of chemistry but no disease knowledge, um, you've, got no, you've got a lot of um, job discovery expertise but no business development capabilities. These are things that are long, you don't necessarily need all of them at the start, but along the way you will need to fill these gaps and, and iterate on the team. Um, you're a startup, you don't have much capital. In fact, now, right now you probably have no capital. So beg, borrow, and steal. Bully everybody you can into giving you everything you can get from them. You know, and that's advice, introductions, um, knock on J&J's door, see if they can help you with a, a kind of focused little experiment um, to help repeat your data. Um, uh, you know, programs like this, um, giving you, you know, prize money, um, you really need to go out and be hungry and go and get everything you possibly can. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so this is part of what I was saying before. So as you go along at, through that iterative process, the plans themselves change. Maybe that means you've got a totally different type of business model. Maybe now you're more of a, have a you have a device, you could go in a, in a regulated medical device context, or you could go more in a consumer context. So I've heard s several discussions with people in this room today where there are, they are facing that choice. They're ex totally different shaped organizations. Um, people change. You know, we are all human beings. We have, we have personal lives. People get married, move abroad, have, get pregnant, decide that they want to lie on a beach. Um, you, need to, you need to have a framework and have honest discussions with each other today before there is any conflict about what happens when someone decides they don't want to do this anymore or everybody else decides that they don't want them to do it anymore. They, they're not right for the team. There are, it really is very straightforward as just laying, taking a piece of paper and just laying out, okay, we've got the, we're the founders, we've got the equity. Um, I'm the founding scientist, it's reasonable that I get a bit more than you guys who are just the, um, not just, but you guys who are adding very valuable skills but didn't develop the IP. Um, what happens if in six months, so, you know, Elan has got 33% of, of this company, but what happens if in two months' time he changes his mind and uh, uh, wants to emigrate to Brazil? You know, should he get to keep that 33%? Um, just framing what might happen if the unfortunate does happen up front is an extremely productive exercise. It sounds a bit kind of awkward, but it's a lot less awkward than when he you know, just suddenly goes off to Brazil with his 33% and everybody gets upset. Um, so I would advise you to do that sooner rather than later. Contracts are, um, you know, once you do form your company and you do divvy out the equity, um, those contracts which um, Oldsman will like to help you with and we'll talk about in a second, they are there for when things go wrong. Um, and that can be a people issue or it can be a technology issue, but they're very important to resolve conflict down the line. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so um, you, you come out of this process, or actually to be honest, you come out of um, the boot camp and you, because you should be doing this kind of in parallel, I think. Um, a lot of your technologies will be based around IP that's been, that is sitting within an institution, usually a university. Not necessarily, if you developed it on nights and weekends, that's yours, but if it was using grant money inside a university, nine times out of 10, technically the university owns that intellectual property. So you need to go and get a license and, and, and get you know, the legal right to access that intellectual property. That basically means that you have to interface with the institution's technology transfer offices. Um, they, they often have a bit of a mixed review um, reputation, but actually you should see them as extremely valuable resources. They have, they have, they, they have access to kind of 
IP advice um, can help you um, kind of get get funding for some small like, extra experiments to help you pull the pull the package together and can introduce you maybe to local angel networks. Um, I would recommend being um, trying to work out how you can access how you can get them to work for you rather than viewing them as someone who you have to negotiate hard against to get the license deal out, the, the license, the IP out into a company. Um, where you are today is not necessarily necessary to form your company as, as soon as you leave this room. Often, uh, it's very clear what needs to get done for you to have validated your initial hypothesis. And that doesn't mean you need to form a company, step outside of academia, and raise money to fund that research. You're sitting in an institution that has access to grant funding, and you're sitting in kind of, kind of world-leading high-tech labs. If you know what you need to do, there's nothing wrong with spending the next 12 months using grant money to fund that critical experiment to produce the data that you think will unlock investment, a partnership, whatever. Get a good sense of what is that inflection point, that data that you really need to kind of go out on your own and then go and then start your company. So it doesn't need to be an immediate, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, I need to start my company. When you're a company, you have costs, you are restricted in your access to grant funding, um, you're no longer sitting in, in, in those labs, so just don't necessarily rush to form your company. <coughs> I think um, you know, you know, every institution handles these things differently, um, but a rule of thumb is you know, the, the science, scientists who are developing the technology um, don't own the IP, but if, they, if there is a kind of opportunity to build a company around the IP and spin it out, there is a negotiation between them and the technology transfer, but the rule of thumb is they kind of split that equity 50, around 50-50 between university and um, you know, founding scientists. Um, so in, if you make that assumption, uh, you're broadly insulated from that. I would also say that investors um, are, one way or another, they, they, they typically tend to um, reset valuation and say, you're on a university spin out. I don't know what, I don't really, I'm not gonna, they don't actually give you that much credit on whether you've run that extra mouse model or not. It, it, it's, you're a startup coming out of university, therefore the range of valuations I'll give you is between X and Y and it's not very high. And um, so I actually think it's a value creating decision if there is resource available and it's not, it doesn't come with too many strings, I, I, would, I would take, free money if I can get it, if you're the scientist. There may be a time issue that you could do it a lot faster if you had a higher amount of money in a commercial context versus having to kind of jump through all the hoops and manage all the other considerations of it being an academic uh, um, program. Um, so this is the negotiation of the IP. Um, you know, so work with the, IP, the technology transfers, but they, they have a, a job that spans all kinds of areas. They're not experts as individuals in this particular one. So um, just because they tell you this is the way, you know, this is the, uh, the development path that they, you should progress, don't take their words for it. As we've said many times, you should be running around getting everybody's opinions, especially industry, patients, um, other investors. So just don't take their word for it. Um, they can be quite difficult to negotiate with. The best way to negotiate with them is to go and find investment and uh, get an investor to put a term sheet saying, we love this company, we really want to fund it, and these are the conditions on the license, uh, these are the terms within any license that we would be willing to fund this company. 
um, and then use that as a term sheet to walk into a technology transfer office um, as a stick to hit them with, which is, well, you've got to accept these terms and then we can get this funded, or you don't accept these terms and then there's no company. So, that. Now, this is true. I have a per perverse interest in tech transfer offices, actually. Um, and if what he's saying is true, and in particular, come prepared. You guys would come prepared to a lab meeting. You would come prepared, ideally, to one stars. Before you ever go to talk to a TTO, read up on TTOs, read up on licensing. Just to kind of run through a few key terms, I think some of the legal session might cover some of it, but you know, um, when you do license it, you want an ex exclusive license to the IP. They don't, you, you don't want to find out that um, you know, two months later, there's you know, several other companies are setting up around the same discovery. Um, it should be a long enough option period. Usually what they say is they give you um, X amount of time to go and raise money or execute on some um, uh, some work that is moving towards a milestone and if you don't achieve that you lose the license and it comes back to the university so you need a long enough runway to be able to get to that point um, you need to make sure that the field that you're getting access to is sufficiently broad to achieve everything you want to do today but everything else you might kind of think of or pivot towards down the road you need to be global license, um, and then royalty rates and milestones is the, probably the area. Those the things I just mentioned are reasonably standard, but the royalty rates and the milestones are where the real negotiation really ends up. Um, if it's a drug, my rule of thumb is it needs to end up as one to two percent royalties, and milestones need to be low and far out, because otherwise, you raise money, you make some progress. And now half the money you've raised has to go back to pay the technology transfer, and now you're short money. So those are the things to um, think about. The lawyers are your friends in this, um, as are your potential investors, to be honest. Um, I sp I've helped numerous companies that I'm interested in with their discussions with the um, tech transfer <laughs> officers. Dan, this doesn't seem to be doing the, the yeah, thing. Except PDF, you can see I've been over there. Oh, that's well, fine. We'll work with it. Um, so I think, yeah, so, so we talked about, um, so now you're going to write your business plan. In parallel, you should be thinking about how you're going to approach your tech transfer office and get access to that intellectual property. Um, your business plan will involve assumptions about everything from what's the next um, prototype going to look like all the way through to what's the commercial, um, uh, commercial opportunity here. You just need to work your ass off and 
diligence, every single piece. There's all kinds of things that you have no way to um, prove. You can't prove that um, today that your phase three trial is going to cost X and it's going to be this endpoint. But do talk to lots of people and give it your best guess and, and kind of frame what that is. If you come into an investor meeting and they ask you questions around that and you don't know, you kind of lost credibility on everything else that came before. So, you know, working very hard to at least put a straw man out there of how we're going to do this, deliver it all the way through to a commercial opportunity, even though you don't have the actual answer, putting your best guess and putting some robust argument around that is, is, um, is uh, critical. Um, hone your elevator pitch. You never know when you're going to walk into um, Gene from J&J at a cocktail party or something. And you, you, know, you, you, want, you need to be able to be very slick and being able to communicate exactly what you're doing, why it's, why it's attractive within two minutes, because otherwise you know, you're in that. Or, you know, it's called an elevator pitch because you're supposed to be able to communicate it if you get in a, a lift with someone, and by the time you get to the top floor, you've already sold them on your company. So <coughs> practice that. Um, uh, I'm quite sure how, what he meant to do here, but Beg, Borrow, and Steal is written in large red letters. So, um, um, yeah, so this is, this is a, actually a very simple way to think about what is an elevator pitch. It's we. Um, yeah, we, we do something, um, how do we do it, so that this happens. And just think about those three bullet points as they relate to your business, and, and, and that's refine it into being you know, the, succinct um, and inspiring and the right language, and that's it, that's your elevator pitch, and memorize it, and get everybody in your team to memorize it. Um, just because you're not the CEO doesn't mean that you, need, uh, you don't need to be able to articulate externally what it is you're doing. Um, Dan, what's our time? Five minutes over. Five minutes over, okay. I think we covered most of this other than, you know, other than staying inside university and getting investors, is there, is there non-dilutive funding you can, you can yeah. access? Um, you know, there are, there are foundations. If I'm uh, developing um, something in Parkinson's, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has a lot of money it wants, wants to give. <coughs> Work out where those pots of free money are and, and see if you can leverage them because they may be the, the kind of critical um, amount of financing that bridges you to being able to unlock much larger pools of capital. Um, angel investors, um, again, another good source of early financing, but beware of um, ending up with 40 different private investors in your, uh, in your shareholder base, none of which want to be diluted and all expect you to have sold for a billion dollars within 18 months. Um, uh, in addition to your elevator pitch, you should all be pitch practicing your you know, proper half hour pitch or and an hour pitch, because they're slightly different. Because that, when you go in to communicate to investors, um, it needs to sound credible, robust, and clearly articulated. Um, I think in the interest of time, why don't we... Sure. Um, we'll be sharing some slides as well. Yeah. And, um, Sean will be around tomorrow. But no, I think Matt, Matt did all the key points. The, the, the one thing I'd like to re-emphasize again, I think you know, Matt did a great job here, and Sean does a good job as well, is that they borrow skill. As a, is, as not just as an entrepreneur, as a young entrepreneur, people do want to help you. There's this enthusiasm surplus and you know so you can walk up to, to Gene at, at J and J and ask him for lab space. The worst thing they could say is, is no, but I actually might say yes. Right? And uh, you could do that, right? A, a forty five year old entrepreneur is just they're not gonna just have as much sympathy on that and want to help them as much. So by all means you know do leverage that. Leverage the fact that people want to help you if you're quite excited